Welcome to another edition of Five Favourite Books with me, Bella de Brera. Um, this is a podcast uh, as part of the Foundations of Western Civilization programme where I speak to very special guests about their top five favourite books and why they've influenced them in their lives. And today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Janet Albrechtson to my second podcast. Um, I'm delighted to see you, Janet, and you've made me envious already because you've already told me that your air conditioning is on. And I'm in Melbourne freezing <laughs> in six <laughs> degrees. <laughs> it is another world, isn't it? It's yeah, not fair. At the moment. Yeah. Now, um, I was thinking about how I was going to introduce you and... It's very hard because you've done so much. You are a, <clears throat> a Renaissance woman. So um, obviously um, the chairman of the IPA, my uh, wonderful organization, you uh, are a columnist for the Australian, you're a lawyer, you've uh, spent five years on the board of the ABC, which I think you described as um, a Soviet style workers collective. <laughs> which I'm sure endeared you very much. We can much cover that the... at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> I think we will. <laughs> um, and, um, and, um, just an amazing um, all-round um, Renaissance woman. So I'm very interested to hear what your five favourite books are. And and I think we should start with the, the book that influenced you perhaps earliest on in your life. Um, yeah, I think... Sorry, I think I think that right. makes sense. It's a you know it's a tremendous thing to it's it's a huge indulgence to go back and think about the kinds of books that had an impact. I mean, when I talk about my five favourite books, I've got lots of favourite books, but the books that matter to me the most are the ones that invariably had an impact. Yeah, um, I think it's a very difficult thing to do, isn't it? I mean, given the amount of literature there is floating around the world. But so, where should we start? What, where, where would you like to? Which book would you like to talk about first? Well, I'd like to um, start with the book that had an impact when I was a child. Um, and you know, I'm the daughter of uh, Danish migrants who came to Australia in the early '60s. Um, so English was a, a second language for them. They were both, you know, very much working class Danes, um, and they. They had left school early. They um, obviously hadn't gone to university. Uh, my father was a builder. Um, and so there weren't a lot of books around the house. Mm. So it means when you read your first serious book, and this is what To Kill a Mockingbird was for me, um, it has an enormous impact. You know, I'd read Enid Blyton and Trixie Belden and my ha the house was full of Danish magazines that Rellies would send down to <laughs> Australia. In Danish. But there weren't a lot of books. Um, and I think that that really was the first, as I said, serious book. And for me, it had such a deep impact, not just because it's such a beautiful story and it, you know, it's, it's the, it's, you know, a coming of age book, which for, uh, I think I was 12 or 13 when I read it, um, those kinds of books leave an impact just because it's a, you know, a kid very close to your own age going through a whole range of experiences that perhaps you haven't. But because at the end of that book, I was absolutely determined that I wanted to be a lawyer. So I'm, oh, you know, I'm wow. sorry to follow the cliche of Greg Sheridan, wow. whose Year of Living Dangerously yes. uh, you know, really had an impact on what he chose to do with his life. But it was really the same for me um, with To Kill a Mockingbird. So it wasn't that I wanted necessarily to be a criminal lawyer. I mean, who on earth could Mira being Atticus Finch after all, right? But I did want to be a lawyer. That's fascinating. So was this a book that, was it part of the school curriculum or did you just have, was it just lying around the house? How did you... How did you well, it wasn't in my home, but I think I borrowed it from the library. Yeah, right. I don't remember studying it as a curriculum, no. but I'm pretty sure I picked it up in the library one day and I would have known nothing about Harper Lee. Um, maybe the librarian suggested it. Maybe I like the title. That I can't recall. But, you know, it's the kind of book that once you start reading it, it's just it, it engrosses you because, you know, to be taken back as a, you know, sort of 12-year-old in suburban Adelaide into the deep south in... Um, um, Alabama, it was, it was quite something to read. And it, it, it had, I mean, I, I think a few years later I read, um, and this was part of the school curriculum, Merchant of Venice. So between To Kill a Mockingbird and Merchant of Venice with a wonderful character of Portia, mm. uh, I was determined that that was all, I, and I was very focused from that moment on. That was all I wanted to do. That's um, amazing. And I so think this that's, is how uh, much so this is Sorry. how much influence one book had. It really did change the course of your life, didn't it? This it one, absolutely this did. one novel. Yeah. I, I guess we can never know whether at the age of, you know, 16 or 17 I, or, you know, when I was applying at uni I might have applied for law. But I think at an early age when you know what you want to do and you realise that you're going to have to work very hard 
uh, you know, to get there, it's a great inspiration. So it's not just a story, you know, that beautiful story about Scout and Jem and the wonderful writing of Harper Lee and it was a beautiful book and it took her for, to, forever to write. And, you know, I've since then gone back and listened to how she wrote that book and she was so frustrated with it. There were so many drafts and at one stage she stepped out onto the veranda or the balcony of her New York apartment and just saw out the window and just, you know, threw the whole draft out of the window. She was so fed up with it. Oh. <laughs> and her publisher convinced her to pick up the pieces, race down, pick mm. up the you know papers and put it back together. And, you know, what we've seen since with a book like that, I am sure it's had a, a massive impact on so many kids' lives. It must have, and it was it won a Pulitzer Prize, didn't it? I think it did very yeah, soon after it was published. Yeah, um, it won a Pulitzer Prize, and Harper Lee, I've, I, I have long admired because she was she became such a recluse, and she just let that one book basically speak mm. for um, for her. She wasn't prolific in any way. Um, no. There was another book I think released a couple of years ago, but I, I didn't read. I think yes, I started reading it. It was but. called. Um, I wrote that down because I actually did read it, and um, it was extremely disappointing. It was. Go set a watchman, it was. That's right, yes. yeah. I did the same. I started yeah. reading it. But yeah. I think it was put together after she died. It wasn't, you know, finished by Harper Lee. Mm. Um, and the way, as I said, she worked on that first book, it's an extraordinary tale of how a writer puts together a book. Um, so it was, it was just... You know, as I say, it, for me it was life-changing. The other reason when I think back about that book um, and why I'm still so fond about it, Bella, is because it then became in more recent years symbolic of this propensity to ban books mm. because it's so beautifully and so uh, ex clearly, you know, um, encompassed that time in the 1930s in the Deep South. It used the language you know, it used the language of prejudice. It used the N word. Um, it was it, it was a, it wasn't remains a confronting book. So I think it's on the list of most uh, books that have been um, or attempts. Most attempts have been made to ban books. Um, it's right on the top of that list. And, and and what a shame that is. And it has been banned in various schools, especially across the South, in America. And it's only gotten worse, you know, when we when we look at how we have all sorts of trigger warnings and uh, things like that at university. But there is a propensity to kind of, um, you know, this flight to safety for we think we're protecting our kids by not allowing them to read books that are confronting. But it couldn't be further from the truth, could it? And um, yes, and, and how how much poorer would we be without without this book? And how much poorer are children? Now, being the ones that are being deprived of this book will never have that experience. Um, exactly. And I think it's been criticised. I mean, I, I'm surprised it hasn't been cancelled altogether, but it has been criticised for uh, what they call um, a white white saviour um, uh, syndrome because Atticus Finch is a white man who defends a black man. So therefore, we can't even read it at that level. You know, there's wow. this. So, so whatever whatever she does, I think... She's lost in terms of the current the current cancel culture just because of you can read racism racism into anything really can't you? you can cancel anything. But again, you see, the whole point of the book was that that Atticus Finch it was a very unpopular thing for him to do. He was it the was. town lawyer. He was white. There weren't a lot of black lawyers, right? The whole book explains what that kind of period um, looked like and, and and felt like for whether you were Tom Robinson, the man at the centre of that um, of the murder trial who was accused of murdering a white woman, sorry, raping a white woman, mm. or whether you're Atticus Finch and how unpopular. It was for a white lawyer to defend a black man. I mean, that's the whole point of reading the books. So mm. it's, 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 it's completely insane to overlay a book like that from the 1930s with filters um, and claim that it's some kind of racist book. It was the same with Huckleberry Finn. Um, yes, I think that's been well and truly cancelled, hasn't it? <laughs> because, I mean, and that obviously that's the derogatory name for, for Uncle, Uncle Tom is a derogatory name for 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 um, black people who happen to be conservative, <laughs> so uh, you know they, they, this is the problem, isn't it, with the cancel culture? It's just it's just it's just never ending. It is yeah, it is yeah. it is it, it cancels everything. But, but again, we don't want to I talk mean, about that too much in this because we want this to be an uplifting and yes, interesting, absolutely. positive podcast. Although it's hard to talk about. <laughs> well, it was very about. positive for me. Yes. It was, it was it, incredibly positive. It, does, it doesn't get much better than that when a single book like that oh. that you're reading at the age of 12 or 13 um, 
does, I think, change the trajectory and encourage me to work very, very hard at school with a very single focused um, ambition. That's amazing. That really is amazing. And actually it leads, it, I, it, I, I don't know which one you wanted to talk about next, but I thought um, there's a, obviously there's a natural um, connection between To Kill a Mockingbird and another one of the books on your list which is oh, also the, yeah, set in the US. In Cold Blood, we can talk about yes. that. We can jump around exactly. a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I remember exactly when I read In Cold Blood, and I'll tell you why. It was in 1999, and I was in the middle of um, just completing a doctorate. So I can't remember if it was 50,000 words, 60,000, 70,000. I mean, any, these days anything over 1,000 is, is, is big for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was a, it was a oh, big gosh. piece of writing right? and it took me years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as my children like, you know, whenever there's a lull in conversation at our dinner table, my children will recite the name of my um, doctorate, which <laughs> was uh, the regulation of initial public offerings in Australia, you know, the, a, a search for the balance between market forces and regulation. Isn't that sexy, right? It's not. You needed to throw in diversity, intersectionality, um, uh, others, the, uh, other, othering, <laughs> othering somewhere in there. Well, you joke, you joke, but I tell you, I, was, I got so bored with writing that doctorate, Bella, that I inserted a footnote in there mm -hmm. um, for, for the joy of my markers, which it was a ser apparently serious piece of academic writing, uh, which was head of the, the feminist perspective of initial public offerings. And I thought, wait, what? 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 <laughs> Sorry, that... The feminists have got time to write about initial they, public offerings? That there's some kind of <laughs> feminist view or... Yeah. <laughs> It was, you... it was the best. Foot I had a lot of fun putting that footnote in. I, I, I didn't ever get a comment, which I suspect means the, the, the markers didn't actually read the thing. But anyway, it's done. They but so I'm footnote. finishing yes. that doctorate, weighed down by, you know, the number of words. And I wanted to start uh, writing an opinion column. Mm. And um, Karen Maley, who works at the Financial Review, our daughters are at the same school. And she invited me over one morning after we dropped our girls to school. And they were just tiny at infant school. And she sat down with me literally at the same table and helped me write my first opinion column for the Financial Review. Uh, again, very sexy topic on the demutualization of NRMA. Right. So I have moved on. But anyway, Karen <laughs> said, look, if you're going to start writing, there are two things you need to read. The first book she gave me was Strunk and White, The Elements of Style, which I'm always recommending and uh, uh, giving people copies of because it teaches you how to write very clearly, concisely, no messing about. Um, the other book she said was uh, please read In Cold Blood. Again, I hadn't heard of In Cold Blood by um, Truman Capote, but I went off and read it. And it's not that the story itself I found so gripping. It was the way that Truman Capote wrote it that at the time certainly uh, in, in the 60s and 70s was very innovative. It was, it was kind of mixing how a journalist writes with how an author writes and bringing that together. And it had a name. It was called The New Journalism. Um, but it's very concise. It's very clear. Uh, you know, he's, uh, I think he's described as using um, uh, prose that's economical but evocative. Um, which is which a, is a very difficult balance balance to strike, isn't it? Because you don't it, want to be too verbose, but then you want to don't you want to bore people with too much um, precision either? So that's, that's right. Trick, it's, it, it is a, it is you're absolutely right. But he did it beautifully, and it was it was regarded, I think, as a masterpiece of that style of writing, along with some of the writing by Tom Wolfe. Um, for me, it really helped me work out a writing style that I wanted to be my own. Mm. Um, and, you know, the more I look back on the kind of writing that I like and, and, and writing that I really don't like, uh, what I don't like um, is stream of consciousness writing, which to me is just so lazy. It's, it's I this, it's I that, it's I think this, I believe that. There's no kind of discipline. There's no attempt to reason or to form an argument. So um, when I look back on, on, on why I write a certain way, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's not because I wrote about initial public offerings. <laughs> it's because and reading through initial public Pody offerings. And, and Strunk and White, those two books, you know, I almost need a list of 10 books because I think five is very difficult. I'll let, I'll let, you, I'll, I'll let you go on, on the others. We can, we can sort of, I mean, it's five, but, you know, we can hint at yeah. others. No, 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 I'm just throwing it in the mix. But, um, I mean, now that we're talking about Strunk and White, I do wonder whether Karen um, lent me the book. Maybe I should be returning it. <laughs> How long ago was it? 20 years ago. <laughs> I've still got it. 
<laughs> it's a little bit dog-eared though. Anyway, I'll, 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 I might send it to her with a thank you. <laughs> Say I've <laughs> thank ingested you for changing it now. <laughs> thank you for changing my entire life. Um, yeah. So the other reason why I wanted to talk about In Cold Blood after To Kill a Mockingbird was because the I always found it fascinating that um, – the little character, the character in To Kill a Mockingbird was based on Truman Capote. Um, the friend, it was the friend that came to visit um, That's for, right. for the summer holidays. And they were actually, and Harper Lee and Truman Capote were friends in real life. And Harper Lee went to, uh, to, to um, now where was the, where was the family, the Clutter family? Holcomb, Holcomb, Holcomb. Um, Kansas. So, yeah. they, so they, so she travelled with Truman Capote to Kansas to do the the research into this, into this, um, the murder of the family, which is fascinating. So you've got it, um, this relationship between the two characters in the novel, but then in real life as well, and as as adults, and then the creation of another novel, or not a novel, but a, 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 a this crime fiction. So I suppose, I mean, you wouldn't have known that when when you read no, the two, no, I, this amazing I, no. connection. <laughs> no, even, even though it was many years after I read To Kill a Mockingbird, um, I didn't know uh, much about Truman Capote at all and I certainly didn't know that there was a relationship with them. In fact, they were, um, as you said, Truman Capote was a little boy Dill from To Kill a Mockingbird because he used to come and visit in the summer holidays and stay with his aunt just as Dill does in the book. Um, so from the age of five, they became great friends, and in fact, they used to hammer out stories on an old typewriter. Did they together wow. and and dictate to one another as the other was typing? Um, so there were two little authors there working together from the ages of five, six, seven, which That's is amazing. very sweet, isn't it? Um, and then when he moved to New York, she followed him, mm. and I think New York suited uh, Truman Capote. He was a very different kind of person to uh, Harper. Lee, who, as I said earlier, was pretty much a recluse, um, whereas he loved parties, he loved drugs, he loved alcohol. Uh, you know, he lived a very colourful life, if I can say, um, compared to Harper Lee. And, yeah, she did. Once she had put in her final manuscript for To Kill a Mockingbird, she had time on her hands. So she then agreed to go and help uh, Truman Capote with the research for this book. And I think in the end she provided, you know, over 100 pages of research for him, um, to, for him to then sit down and write the book. And, um, you know, it's so interesting because then, of course, they fall out, as is so often the case with people who are so, are so different, and he didn't ever acknowledge her work in that book, and I think, you know, apparently she was very um, upset about that. So um, they didn't end as friends, but they certainly started out, and that, that friendship, I think, um, was a, you know, it's ter it's terrific to learn about how authors come to write books and, you know, what are the influences in their own lives. And I wonder if they if they influenced each other in their writing. Could you any, see any sort of similarities in the in the style? It's quite different, isn't it? It's you it's know, I read really... somewhere, and I don't know if this is it, obviously it's not true, but there there was a time when a lot of people thought that To Kill a Mockingbird had been written by Truman Capote because oh, really? they were that close. Yeah. Um, mm. But I, you know, I, I'd have to go back and reread. But mm. um, no, it didn't strike me reading In Cold Blood that it was, uh, you know, Harper Lee's words or, or vice versa. But it's the, the In Cold Blood is, is an interesting way he approached the story because he wrote, from what I gather, he wrote um, from the point, he, he sort of followed the three story. He, he followed the, the murderers, he followed the family who were murdered and he mm. followed the, 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 the townspeople as well and their reactions to the whole thing. So I think it probably was quite modern in its, uh, as you say, in its, it, it's, it's, it, 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 did it establish a new genre, would you say, in sort of crime fiction? Yeah, um, well, crime fiction but also, as I say, this kind of new journalism where you looked at things from different perspectives and, you know, I think one, an another one of the reviewers writing about Truman Capote said that he knew how to take himself out of a story. He never got in the way of a story uh, when he wrote, when he, certainly when he wrote In Cold Blood, so that, as you say, he looked at the perspective of the Clutter family who were very, uh, you know, all-American, yeah, middle class, so living in rural nice. America. There was this idyllic life that they yeah. led. And, and then the two young men who um, murdered this whole family um, led very different lives. So he was very good at juxtaposing mm you know, the class differences mm. between the murdered and the murderers. Um, Do you think it's influenced other, other um, crime novels and sort of that, that genre since in, 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 even in, um, 
There is, a, there is a bit of obsession now, if you look at Netflix, I don't know if that's a good indication of people's obsession with true crime and, yeah. and, and sort of the, you know, the, the, the most dangerous serial killers in the world. And every time you turn it on, it's just like, how much, how much do people want to listen to true crime? It seemed uh, to, to, to this stuff. And it seems like, was there that interest before Truman? Did he sort of generate that interest, I wonder, with this? That's, with that's this an interesting blood? question. I, I suspect know. you might, I, I think mm. you might be right, actually, because it became so popular. Mm. Um, and not just because it was true crime, but also, as I say, because of the way it was written. Uh, what I would have loved was a podcast by Truman Capote. Yes. About <laughs> Everyone does a podcast these days. Wouldn't that as we know, them? here we are. As we know. Oh, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, the great thing, if you've ever seen the movie um, In Cold Blood, have you seen that, Bella? No, I haven't. I haven't. Well, they had I um, like Philip Seymour Hoffman played Truman Capote, and I tell you, the physical resemblance between the two of them it is quite remarkable and he did such a great job because, again, I, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman, I, I, you know, you look at him and think, oh, there might be a lot of similarities between yeah. you and Truman yes. Capote. So it was a tremendous movie and, and Harper Lee was also in that, in the movie. It's a great story about oh, how well, he wrote that book. Oh, I watch it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He had 8,000 yeah. pages of notes or something, didn't he? And he went, wow. he wrote it, he wrote it um, before the, 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 the murder was solved, I think. That's he right, really yeah. Halfway because... Through. It was just a tiny piece in the New York Times that he saw about this at that stage unsolved murder mm. that then took him down to um, to Hol Holcomb was it Holcomb yes. did I say yeah, yeah. Holcomb yeah um, in, in in Kansas with um, with Harper Lee so it's a it's a it was it was a great book to read and again you know these books that have an impact on you um, just shows how brilliant books can be not just because they're entertaining and you know they open up new worlds for you but they can really change the way that you live how you work um which is quite, why we need to, to encourage people to read which is why I I, I want to do this podcast because I you know I want to I mean people are reading people are reading actually during the the um the worldwide lockdown apparently book sales have gone up massively people are people are returning to, to books again um which is probably one of the few silver linings in this whole thing. Yeah. I but, hope they're um, reading 1984 all over yeah. again, or, for, or at least for the first time. And and maybe Albert Camus' The Plague is so. certainly a bestseller. So. Apparently, apparently, that, apparently they did sell out of The Plague, the copies of The Plague at Dimmicks yeah. in Melbourne at the yeah. very beginning of this this whole coronavirus thing. People are suddenly yeah. like, But people really need to be reading 1984. They well, really could you do. send a copy of that to your premier? Oh, I don't think it, I don't think um, I don't think he's checking his mail at the moment. Mm, probably mm. not. Um, I have I must admit that I have sent because his his email address is online. You can contact your premier because it's a democracy apparently, um, and I have sent him a few emails with some pertinent articles. Um, written Great. By, written by Good some on you. some uh, fellow fellow Australian journalists, um, but you know you don't get any answer. But I don't expect an answer. But it's <laughs> <laughs> it's quietly satisfying anyway. <laughs> But um, I might just take one there and put it on the steps of um, Spring Street. Do. Um, but actually, speaking of Dan Andrews, I know you're meant to be leading which books we talk about, but I, I think it's a good segue into Harry Potter because I think there is a similarity between Voldemort and Dan Andrews in terms of <laughs> in terms of this this um, <laughs> gra this this desire to be immortal. Um, but. We can talk about that later. I haven't thought about that. I've got to be honest. No, really, no yeah, it only I occurred have, to I me haven't. yesterday. No, no. Um, would you like to talk about uh, Harry Potter next? Do you think, I can talk or is about that Harry something? Potter. Is that something? Yeah. When did when did you? Well, I mean, Harry Potter's nineteen ninety seven, so that's about the right the time frame anyway for your book journey, isn't it? More or less. Um, I tell you, um, so this is a really interesting thing to admit. I have only read bits of the various Harry Potter books, but the reason that they're on my list, and mm. when I say Harry Potter, um, I'm doing that kind of sneaky thing from Desert Island Discs where you kind of group together. We're you making know. it. We're, we're talking about yeah. it. We need a bit I'm, of flexibility, I'm talking about right? about because there's seven books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. It's all the same story. It's it just all starts the same. with one yeah, and exactly. ends at seven, it's right? It's not that but big. The reason, <laughs> the reason they had such an enormous impact on me is that when, um, so the first one came out in 1997. My um, first child, Caitlin, was born in 1993. Now, around the age of uh, three, she was desperate to read. She really wanted to read. 
right? Um, I mean, unlike me, she grew up in a house where there were books everywhere mm. and, you know, her mother and father were reading all the time to the point where it was, I'm sure, frustrating that she wasn't getting enough attention. <laughs> but so I thought, how do I teach her to read? Uh, she wasn't at school. Mm. Um, I had been taught, uh, not phonetically, I'd been taught that kind of whole word way where you're meant to just infuse, you know, how to words and language mm. and and, and um, reading by having people read to you um, in the classroom. And that really was a fad in, in the 70s when I was being taught to read. Um, now, that's fine for a lot of kids like me. I, I learned to read, I'm sure, at a very young age. But I didn't know, as, as, a, as, a, as a teaching technique, I had no idea mm. how to teach Caitlin how to read. So I literally signed up for a course um, called the Spalding Method. Now, the Spalding Method is how you teach kids how to read phonetically. I didn't realise that what I'd signed up for was a seven-day course aimed at teachers. I was just a parent fumbling around for like some guidance on how to teach my kid how to read. But I ended up at Sydney University doing a seven day course. I thought it was a bit intense after day four. I thought, gee, this is quite intense. I, mean, I feel like this is Everyone a little else. bit too much. Everyone but I stuck else. with it. I stuck with it. Well, Bella, it was absolutely remarkable to take that home yeah. um, and teach to my three year old. She learned to read so quickly. It wasn't funny. And, and the first, you know, not the first books, but by the time she was six, she was reading Harry Potter. And if you remember, you know, the Harry Potter book, the first Harry Potter book is, is, is well, they're all big books and, and they're complicated and the language is sophisticated and, the, you know, the names of the characters, mm. you know, some of them are really hard words to get your, your head around, right, and, 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 and to, to read. It's not an easy book to read. You know, she, I, I, as I said, I was reading Enid Blyton when she was reading Harry mm. Potter. Mm. Um, and it was so remarkable to see a kid, once they've been given those basic skills, you know, to break down a word, right, and then you build it back up, and you put it in a sentence and off you go. And it wasn't just that she learned how to read. And I've seen it with my other kids because I did the same with uh, my other two children. Um, once you teach them that skill of you've got a problem in front of you, you break it down and then you bring it back together, it's a very lateral way of thinking. It's a very mm. logical, you know, mm. way of thinking. So it carried over into maths, music and other, uh, other skills. So for me, the reason I put Harry Potter on the list is a bit cheeky, I know, because I haven't read all of them. But I was, you know, we always dip into them for years. I would sit there and read the books to the kids. But it was the fact that it was an opening up of their world that was so beautiful to watch as a parent, not just the ability to read, but those books themselves, the way that they just allowed kids imagine nations to run riot um, mm. and I know with my girls they're now in their 20s and certainly um, with one of my daughters even now she'll go back and just read a bit of Harry Potter for comfort um, yes which is yeah. a, which is a beautiful thing yeah. and again it's really because it was as a parent I was just watching this world grow up this world of reading this world of books and Harry Potter did that you know JK Rowling has got the eternal gratitude of millions of parents because she did that for kids and once you introduce them and give them the skills to read, it was that blending of giving Caitlin the skills to read um, and then providing that book which was just mm. um, beautiful to watch. Well, first of all, I mean, I've got to say, <clears throat> what is the education department doing wrong here? If you can do, uh, <clears throat> as a lay person, if you can do a week of how to teach your, your own daughter to read Harry Potter at six, then something clearly is wrong, isn't it, with with how they're teaching children how to read and write in Australian schools. If well, I gave her the building blocks, Bella, right? Yeah. I gave her the building blocks and because I could see it, she was just, you know, she was this little sponge and it just, mm. it worked so beautifully. What we did was as parents, we found a school that uh, had retrained all of their teachers using the Spalding mm. method, right? So that was ASCOM here in Sydney. Um, and it really was the, you know, the, the major reason that we picked that school because, and we had the, you know, the fortune that we could do that, we could afford to do that. But boy, you know, if every mm. teacher in Australia mm. could be trained in that, well, it's expensive, exactly. the investment at the start is investment, but it's become, you know, this is one thing I discovered as a, as a, as a writer years later, I discovered it was so political to talk about how we teach kids how to read. It was like mm. some, you know, like phonics was fobbed 
off as some kind mm. of conservative conspiracy that George Bush was trying to impose yeah. on the world. I thought, I just want my kids to read. <laughs> right? but, th this is, but this goes back to the, the, this, this modern obsession with Rousseau and the idea that you, by, by teaching children to read and to write and by, by teaching them, <clears throat> by endowing them with knowledge, you're corrupting them. It comes from that, that you know, this, this idea that children just should sort of teach themselves and they should just mm, absorb mm. stuff. So, so it's, you, know, it, you can, it's, it, it is political, unfortunately. And this is the problem with why we have this situation that we have in Australia now with education, because it's been a belief that you, you shouldn't actually educate people because you're destroying that you you know, you're ruining them with this civilization with Western civilization. It's, it's, it's really, it's really insane, but unfortunately, it's wacky. This is no, what, it's it wacky. is wacky, yeah. but this is what's going on. Yeah. So, yeah. because, you know, because the, you know, the proponents of the whole word method, world word method, which is the way I was taught, will say, we want to, in, we want to give kids critical thinking skills. Mm. And I think that's great, but they need to learn to read before exactly. they can critically think exactly. about anything. Right. So let's just let them learn how to read really easily. And what really bothered me, because I've been such a close, follower of all of this and I you know three children two girls one boy the girls schools were implementing Spalding or at least you know a, a completely phonics based method it was very very it was taken on very seriously it wasn't oh we do a little bit of this we do a little bit of that which means you don't really do anything at all properly mm. um, right the boys schools were not doing that and I thought what a shame that boys education was being led I'm talking about the private school system you know the boys schools were not doing the same as the girls schools in terms of a equipping with them with the same building blocks. If, if kids get that at the age of four, mm. five, six, I tell you, it sets them up for life. so beautifully yeah. for life. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it really does depend again. It's it's down to parents now, isn't it, really? Just if they want, if they have access to something like you did and then they, they take the time. But what parents, parents don't have the time a lot of the, to, to, to do this. They entrust their children to, to the state yeah. and to the school and they expect their children to come back with the basic skills and they're, they're not getting them but I must admit that I haven't read Harry Potter either I sort of missed out I was the wrong I was too old when it came out um and I did I and and I never had the excuse of children to give them Harry Potter to read but I think you know you say that you were just reading Enid Blyton at the time but I think it was the equivalent thing it was this imagination I remember reading Enid Blyton as a child and it, and Enid Blyton tapped into that the child's imagination you know you had um things like the magic wishing chair which would or the magic faraway tree where you, you you know you'd go up to different lands and it really appealed to something in in your children's imagination and i mm -hmm. think from what i can gather harry potter and this whole this whole world this this parallel world does the same for for for, for the for the, the this next generation of children and um but again not wanting to go back to cancel culture you know obviously jk rowling is has come a cropper very recently with with the uh, with this this movement to, to cancel anyone who who doesn't conform to the um, to the orthodoxy of the day uh, when it comes to gender and and her comments about transgender have tried to have her cancelled from 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 the world. I don't think yeah. they'll succeed because she's too she's too successful. She is too successful. She can't. Yeah. And, they can't. And, and you know there were a number of staff members. Um, at her publishing house who who, who wanted to uh, block, um, I think, one of her recent pieces of writing because of this brouhaha over mm. her comments about the importance of sex to her. Mm. I mean, she was talking about how important it was to her to, uh, to be a woman and how we shouldn't, um, if, if we're talking about that, that shouldn't be hateful. Right. I don't know how we've reached the position that we have, but that's now regarded as hateful and somehow transphobic. And of course, look, Bella, I don't know why she went onto Twitter, quite frankly, to no. make these comments no. originally. Yeah. You, you, you're going to know what happens. You know if it's you going could, to happen, you, don't you? You're just going to know that that's going to happen. So, in a sense, she was inviting a bit of controversy, maybe. I mean, what the shame is that it's, um, I, I don't care if people disagree or, or agree with her comments on, on this. Uh, the shame is that people are now there's a backlash against the Harry Potter books. Yes, which seems yes. just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, whatever an author might say separately, 
Does it mean that we have to write off the books that have given kids so, you know, so much joy and sold millions and just unleashed imaginations? Um, I think that's kind of ludicrous. But again, you know, look, they censored Enid Blyton, didn't they? Who was mm. it? Dick? Who were the boys in, in Enid Blyton? Oh, Dick I can't, and I can't um, remember their names. Dick and someone or other now have to do equal amounts of housework. <laughs> The new editions of Enid Blyton have been cleansed. Because that's something that <laughs> six-year-olds are worrying about when they're reading, reading, eating, <laughs> when they're reading Enid Blyton. Six-year-olds don't know anything about housework, let alone the, the, the sort of the so supposed gender roles of who does what. It's actually insane. It's actually insane. It is. It's, it hasn't it's... stopped me from asking my son to do lots of chores around the house. <laughs> the fact that I grew up reading Enid Blyton, it really has had. You know how books can have a lot of impact yes. and then have no impact? None of, the which fact is why... that Dick wasn't doing any housework really didn't sit with me. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm just not a very good feminist. <laughs> uh, well, look, I mean, what is what is a feminist in 2020? I certainly wouldn't want to associate with my uh, align myself with many of the the women who do call themselves feminists in 2020. Mm. Um, but yeah, so Harry Potter, um, I you know, sh is it too late to go back and read all seven books as a as a 40 something year old? Yes, I think it is. But, it's a um, lot of time, but if I were on an time. island like Desert Island is, because I would take the Harry Potter books with mm. me, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, speak, okay, feminist could be a, a good way into the next book, although that might be the last, the last one that we want to talk about. Well, I think we should actually talk about what a good feminist and a bad feminist yes. is. I think that's a nice segue. Um, I think so too. Yeah, yeah, because the... Um, one of the books on my list was Helen Garner's book that I, I would have read at the time it came out, which I think was... Oh, 95, gosh, 95. 95, yeah, yeah. Um, the First Stone, um, and it was headed The First Stone, Questions About Sex and Power. Note the title, Questions mm. About Sex and Power. Mm. Um, but, of course, her writing that book, even raising questions about sex and power, and it arose, her story, the book was about a, um, a case of sexual harassment allegations of sexual harassment against the master of Ormond College at Melbourne University at the time uh, by two young women um, that arose from, I think it was a social event, a dinner or a dance or um, some kind of university social event. So she wrote about the fact that these two young women who were at the very prime of their lives, very confident young women, um, went to the police with these allegations against this man um, and he ended up in court over it and she asked a lot of questions about she, look the, the reason the book is such a genius piece of writing is because she did not walk away from the fact that an institution like Ormond had for decades been you know the bastion of male power it was absolutely an institution. Boys club. <clears throat> it was a boys mm. club there was no question about it mm. but by 1995 uh, that wasn't necessarily the case. Obviously, women had been there for a couple of decades, I think, and she raised a number of questions about um, that relationships is, you know, as, as much as it would be easy if they were black and white, they're just not, that there are asymmetries of power um, in any kind of relationship. Um, they're not always working, you know, in favour of men, not always, mm. and mm. at any particular time, that power relationship can change between a man and a woman in a couple. Uh, and she raised questions about the gradations of an offence mm. um, <clears throat> and whether it was worth racing off to police and ending up in court mm. over um, allegations. These were, I mean, in the end, uh, as she writes about it, uh, they were clumsy sexual advances by a master, mm. um, which he denies, by the way. But at, at, at their worst, that's what they were. Mm. Um, and it, it, it's a beautiful read because it's written by a woman who is a feminist who is willing to ask questions that she knows will probably unsettle some of the more orthodox feminists. One of the other really interesting questions she writes, which has such resonance now, is whether you pursue a case like this as a means of, uh, as a corrective for past injustices uh, because there were, you know, I, I think there were women around these two young women who were um, egging on, supporting, I don't know what the right word is, uh, but they, um, you know, they were happy to see it go to court. And to what extent uh, should we use a 
a, a current injustice, no matter how small, to seek recompense for past injustices? How fair is that? So these are all questions when you think about it. Mm. She was talking about more than uh, 25 years ago that today are even even more relevant. That's why it's a book that I do reread from time to time. And I did reread it when Julia Gillard got up in Parliament and made her, you know, some people say famous, I say infamous speech on misogyny. I went back and read Garner's book because there's just so much nuance to uh, to relationships that I think a lot of feminists these days are not willing to countenance. And we see that with the Me Too movement so often. Mm. There's, you know, if you raise any questions about Me Too, uh, whether are we throwing away the presumption of innocence too easily? Uh, what about due process? You know, when you think of the Brett Kavanaugh um, mm. proceedings, <clears throat> there was no due process there. Um, and yet that became, um, you know, Time magazine ran stories on how this was going to change America. Uh, I remember, you know, the then managing director of the ABC, Mark Scott, saying, gosh, I hope, you know, I hope she has a lasting impact. I mean, this was a woman who couldn't remember lots of the details around allegations that she had made against um, Brett Kavanaugh, who was being nominated for the Supreme Court. Uh, and at that time, you know, when that was being, uh, when those proceedings were underway, the National Organisation for Women said absolutely, resolutely, we will stop Kavanaugh. I mean, they didn't care about the presumption no, of innocence, no, right? No. Yeah. Um, but strangely, you know, they did when it came to Bill Clinton so many years earlier. Back yes. then they said, well, you know, an allegation made is not an allegation upheld and you know, we have to recognise that Bill Clinton's a complex human being with all sorts of strengths and weaknesses and because he's got put good policies, we're not going to rush to judgement. It's like this is political, mm. right? This is not principled feminism. It's political feminism. And I think that uh, Garn reading Garner's book really, I, it, it just encouraged me to be curious about, about how feminists approached issues um, and how there was this kind of cementing around what was good feminism, what, what was bad feminism. Not much has changed. Not much has changed at all. Her book would be supremely unpopular now, I, I, I presume, with, with, with the, is it, are we in the fourth wave or the fifth no, wave? Who would know? Famous? I don't who know. Who would know? When um, I hear waves, I think of COVID and I don't so really do think I. of feminism It's anymore. awful. <laughs> it um, is. I used to think of it as a beach and now it's just COVID. I know, it's, Any it's kind another, of wave is it's just COVID. It's another word that's been ruined for us. <laughs> yes, has not it? Along with social yeah. and distancing. Oh. Together they're just, I never want to hear that again. Yeah. Um, I don't know that it's a new wave, though, Bella, as much as, you know, you think that there are kind of you know, feminism moves on. When you think of uh, the treatment of Margaret Atwood, who, who raised concerns about an academic at the University of, I think, British Columbia, um, allegations were made against him. He was told there were allegations against him by a woman, but the university wouldn't provide him with any details and he wasn't allowed to talk about it. So he had no details. He wasn't allowed to talk about it. And Margaret Atwood, you know, eventually got in the media and Margaret Atwood wrote a piece saying, but what, like, where's the due process here? Mm. Where's natural mm. justice? For that, she got labelled a bad feminist. Mm. And she said, really, I'm a bad feminist because I believe in due process? I because mean, she this doesn't is extraordinary. Hate all men, isn't it? Isn't it because she just doesn't hate all men? Doesn't that make you a good feminist these days in that, in that, in that measurement? That men are responsible oh, for, all, for everything yeah. terrible in the world and therefore... That they that that all men are born. This is the this is what they teach in the universities. This is what I think I wrote an article a couple of years ago about how they had the, the workshops at Melbourne University about um, men had to be less like men, you know, the, um, because they were too masculine. So this yeah. this whole this whole uh, masculinity is now one of the sins of the modern day. Uh, um, you know. It's one of the, the commandments. The, what am I trying to say? It's a sin to be masculine. It's 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 turn. It's it, but it's a it's a it's a um, it's a good thing to be to be a fem. But it's not even a good thing to be feminine, is it? The no. Don't, see, this is the problem. Can you can you imagine this world? This I think problem. I need to write this book. This book is where we basically play out a um, a world where men are not allowed to be masculine, mm. uh, where uh, you're not allowed to talk about sex uh, mm. and, and what it means to you, where everything's incredibly puritanical. There are no gradations of you know nuance. There's no grayness in the world. Um, it would be a terrible world to live in 
right? And you're not allowed to flirt or do anything. Even but this is the world that they're creating. Slightly risque. Imagine living in that world. Imagine. I think we do. Like it would well, be, I don't need to yeah. imagine. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't. I don't think so. I think. It, I think it's happening around us, but we can choose to live the we way can, we do. We can. Um, and I think that's with feminism. I think there is a group of women um, uh, who who do follow that kind of line that you've laid out. I don't think most women do. Um, but I think there are a lot of women who kind of cleave towards, you know, where the feminists sit, not because they necessarily hate men, but because it becomes a bit of default thinking, right? Mm. Oh, we need quotas, right? Because uh, everyone's saying we need quotas and it's not fair that men get the jobs. Well, you know, if you start to think that through, and, you know, this is where I think I must be a bad feminist because I've literally had it said um, about me that I must really not like women mm. because yes, I don't is... believe in quotas. Yeah. I think, but but hang on, I have such huge respect and admiration for women who use their talent, their skills to get where they are. Um, h- how can that be someone who doesn't like women? But this is, you know, this is where we're at with with a lot of the feminists around certainly the whole workplace agenda, which is really, really um, very strong. You know, I, I, I know because I talk to a lot of people in corporate Australia and it's one of the dirty little secrets that boards these days are just filled with quota women mm. um, who aren't very good at their job. I'm sure there are lots of men who aren't very good at their job, but we currently have institutionalised a mm. system which goes around choosing people, knowing that they won't be terribly good at their job, but they tick a box, they're female. Yes. I mean, yes. oh, how So they're not being chosen we... on merit. But this is, this is the identity politics. This is what we're seeing in Victoria with the, 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 the choice of um, the security company that was based on, on um, diversity and inclusion rather than merit which is why we have the problem that we have with the quarantine thing and the whole... It's part of the same the same disease, isn't it, really? You it's couldn't make it disease. up, could you, Bella? I know. Could you make I that know. up? If, I mean, if someone wrote that story two yeah. years ago, a year I ago, know. six months ago, you couldn't make that up. But it's um, been lurking the whole time. Unfortunately, it's 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 now becoming public knowledge that this is, yeah. this is, this is what's happening. Um, but so is Helen Garner, did she... Has she said anything... Um, recently about this so she wrote the book 25 years ago did she actually comment on the me too movement did she did she add her voice to to this at all i has haven't followed whether she has um i've often thought that i'd like to interview her about it it's quite i mean when she wrote in um the first stone it was incredibly controversial mm. and 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 she was you know there, there were so many feminists who hated the book um, and, and and that's fine. Like you're allowed to disagree with the book, but mm. it was the way that she was portrayed as being a bad person for writing this book. You, you know, I mean, you know, even back then you couldn't just disagree. You had to paint the person you were disagreeing with as being bad, um, not just wrong, and things have only gotten worse from there. So I, I don't know if she has – she would certainly be really interesting on, on this issue. Um because the book, if it was gutsy and controversial then, to reread it, it's an even gutsier and more controversial book now. If you wrote that now, uh, you know, heaven help you. You'd never get invited mm. to a writer's festival for its starters. Well, you'd probably um, never get it published, would you? <laughs> That's true. So <laughs> <laughs> you'd have to do some, some oh. self-publishing. Or you could do a podcast. <laughs> you could do a podcast, yeah. yeah. Um, so final, final book is um, Tender is the Night, which is F. Scott Fitzgerald, 1934. So we're finishing on the earliest one. But um, lovely book. Tell me why this features in your top five. Well, it was a um, – I think in high school I, I part of the curriculum was to read The Great Gatsby, um, like – like squillions yeah, like of everyone other else. school kids. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a great right. book, though. It's a great book. It's a great book. It's a great, you know, up there with sort of, you know, we read Evelyn Waugh, we read, you know, um, Scott Fitzgerald. They were terrific books that we were given as, as kids. And we were, you know, we were 12 or 13, 14 maybe. Um, but I love The Great Gatsby so much that I ended up reading all of his books. Um, this Side of Paradise, which I think was his first book that he wrote uh, when he was in his early 20s. Uh, it didn't have quite the amount of cynicism um, that his later books did. Uh, it's a beautiful book. But Tender is a Night is absolutely my favourite because it just, it's the way it's written. You know, he just has a, 
there's a beautiful beat to the way that Scott Fitzgerald writes. Um, I know that Ernest Hemingway didn't mm. like his, didn't like um, Tender as a Night. Um, there's that famous correspondence between the two of them where he said, yeah, not, just not, not your best. You could, you could do better than that. But I think some years later he decided that it was a very, very good book. And it is one of those books when you go back and reread it, it's it's better and I picked up my old copy and, and had a look at it and I just I love going back to my old books and just seeing what I underlined and I used to I used to copy out phrases you know quotes from books and put them in a little a little book um, that I went and found the other day and it's interesting to go back mm. and just see what caught your eye um, and there were so many beautiful um, sentences you know, like in the end, writing's the art, art of writing a beautiful sentence. And as I said, there was a rhythm to, way, to the way he wrote. And I didn't realise, I only learned this later, that he was highly influenced, not just by poetry, which doesn't surprise me, but by Joseph Conrad. And yeah. I, I would have read every Joseph Conrad book there is when I was when I first started out as a lawyer at Freehills. So it was really interesting to to see you know that connection. I love learning about connections between different authors and finding out where they get their uh, inspiration or you know some kind of artistic wisdom from. And that was a, that was a great influence for him. So Tender as a Night is just such a beautiful story about. Uh, you know, a man who had so much ambition as a as a young psychiatrist, as Dick Diver, the main character, was, and how that ambition just disintegrates when he chooses a life that's so shallow, um, very glamorous, by the way. Mm. You know, if you're if you're a little girl in Adelaide, suburban Adelaide, again, this is a wonder of a book, right? You're reading about, reading about this life on the Riviera. Um, in, in the 1920s, it was just extraordinary to read. I mean, my parents had fantastic parties, may I say, but these parties on the Riviera, they sounded like something else. <laughs> they did. So, And he was so great at just bringing a, a whole other era and it was that age of American greatness in the 20s before um, the stock market crash and after World War I. He brought that to life, the jazz age, and but in the end it was a... That what you get out of a book like that is just how shallow a life um, lived can be and how that damages, you know, the soul of a man. Um, well, he was part of the, the lost generation, wasn't he? This is the lost generation in between First World War and stock market crash. Sort of uh, wealthy, but um, just come out of the First World War, a bit directionless. Life didn't really have that much meaning, but there's this sort of sense that of... Just enjoying the 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 the, the time and the place, um, yeah. hedonism, but not really, but not really going anywhere and not having a an, no, an aim. That's right, and, 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 and that comes through in the book. And the impact of that on a person's life. I mean, I, I love I love the book because of the relationship, and it's also very autobiographical, um, obviously, right? So because F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, did live that kind of life and he married a woman like Dick Diver in the book who had a severe mental problems um, and uh, so Dick Diver marries a woman called Nicole who's a very, very wealthy American who is in a Swiss asylum and he ends up marrying his patient. And he was a bit of an imposter, actually, because he wasn't rich, but he marries a rich woman because their family is basically buying a doctor to look after their sick, you know, daughter stroke sister. So he's, in a sense, kind of this a gigolo for this rich family, but he becomes this larger than life. Everyone loves Dick Diver. He's the most charming, you know, most interesting, funny, smart. Um, and then at the end of the book, there's been this transference of power from Dick to Nicole, um, who has battled mental illness for years, um, much like his wife, and she becomes a very strong person. And then there's this terrible line at the end where he says to Nicole, I, I can't help you anymore, I'm trying to save myself. Um, but she really doesn't need help anymore because she's stepped out of his shadow um, and become very much her own person. But he's just a shell of a man because he's, in a sense, just thrown all that ambition aside. So it was a great book for a kid to read. Uh, you know, like I was an ambitious kid and it was a really good book to read about the importance of maintaining a sense of purpose in life. And in the end, if you don't have a sense of meaning, what, what is there? Well, it's what Jordan Peterson has been saying for the last three or four years, yeah. isn't it? Uh, life you're is right, short. yes. Life is short and you just have to have meaning even if it's just getting out of bed. And any job, he said, just any job to get you out of bed. 
it gives you purpose, it gives you meaning. And yeah. I suppose once once she started on the road to recovery, he has he has no purpose, he has no meaning. He's just a as you say, he's a shell of a man and Yeah, he's thrown away his career. He's um there's no one, you know, he goes back to the Riviera and, and, and he has no friends there. No one wants to associate with him. Him, He has a series of scandals and, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tragic book but it's a beautiful, you know, it's beautifully written like all of Scott Fitzgerald's books, I think. And, um, you know, he died young. Uh, he, he, he spent a lot of time, again, writing that book. I think The Great Gatsby he wrote in under a year and this one took him, I think, seven or eight years t- to write and... 17 drafts so he really struggled writing this book um that was his last book too i think was it okay yes I, I yeah didn't know that, that. was it yeah, and i yeah. think he was disappointed at at its reception i think hemingway wasn't the only one who was That's slightly right. disappointed by it yeah 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 and and I, he he died poor too because he spent all his money and you know he was racking up debts his whole life and um yeah there was a sense of dick diver being scott fitzgerald Mm, yeah, very sad. But a wonderful book again. Um, and and I think I almost prefer it to Great Gatsby as, as you do. I think it's got a little bit more depth to it. Um, Great Gatsby is, has been ruined a bit, I think, with, with the, the films that have been made. So many films, so many. This Baz Luhrmann film adaptation, I think, is sort of took some of the, the depth away from that book for me personally, but... Um, the original film was good, though. Did you see the original film with oh, Robert Redford with, yes. and Mia Farrow? Yes, that, that was stood, very that, good. That I could go back and yes. watch. That was yes. a, that was a, that was a yeah. great adaptation yeah. of the book. Yeah. Um, yeah, they could have done Tender as a Night. You know, they could do a beautiful, um, uh, I, I think, film or, or, or series on Tender as a Night. It they really like, could. Yeah, it would because there are so many terrific characters in there. You know, like there's so much about class. There's, there are just so many beautiful themes to explore through the different characters. Um, I always remember the um, the guy who ran Gauss's hotel. I don't know if it was Gauss or Gauss's hotel where they used to go at the, on the Riviera. Uh, you know, this he he was some lowly little guy. He wasn't even close to their kind of you know class. Um, and he's required to go and pick up one of these um, these these rich women who gets arrested for doing something or other. And she's so incredibly rude to him. <laughs> and and he's just this very lovely ordinary kind of bloke who says, "I've never met such a woman." <laughs> I can just see that character come to come to life on screen. Who are these Americans? Who are these people? <laughs> yeah. It'd actually be quite fun to uh, to uh, to be in charge of the casting, wouldn't it? It'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's say someone does that. Perhaps um, perhaps someone will listen to this and think that is a brilliant idea. And the look, if they can do it to Big Little Lies, they can do it to Tender. They can and do I, it. Right? They can yeah. indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, but I think actually most of the books we've talked about, all of the books we've talked about tonight, have been made into films. Except is that for right? Tender is the Night, yes. That is true. And what a great movie To Kill a Mock, just to do full circle, what a great movie oh. To Kill a Mockingbird was. I didn't, we all fall in love with. We um, all fell in love with Gregory Peck. <laughs> with Gregory Peck. Oh, we did. <laughs> and didn't we all want to be Scout? Well, as a little girl, uh, yeah, I absolutely wanted to be oh. Scout, that tomboy, yeah. And, well, Harper Lee was a, was a tomboy in, 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 as a child. She was, and, yeah. And, um. And Truman Capote did have a lisp and was a little bit more, um, I don't want to use the word feminine, but she was, interestingly, she took on that, the, the little boy character, and he took on the... And she was his protector when they hung yes. out together as children. She was very yes, much the protector yes, right. because he was the young, sensitive little boy who I think was probably bullied a bit, um, and she would have none of that. So, yeah, it's wonderful to see those books. Um, it is. You know, when you, when you, later in life when you read about the authors and, and you come to know a bit more about how the books were written and why they were written, um, it it's, it's just adds to a book that had such impact when you were, you know, 12 or 13. Aren't we lucky to have these as part of our, of our, of our civilization to be able to talk about these books? We're very fortunate. And that's why I want And we to, should remember that. We should we remember should that remember every time that. someone tries to, everyone yes. tries to censor a book or even change the language. I mean, with, you know, with Huck Finn, the history is confronting. So therefore the language is confronting. 
right? That's the whole purpose. I mean, it's an anti-racist book. It satirises, you know, southern prejudices. But the whole purpose of a book like that is to capture the language of a time that is so confronting. And if we feel offended by it, we should think about why we're feeling offended and try to imagine. I mean, one of the great things, I'll just, you know, maybe finish here because otherwise people will get so bored. One of the great things for me with To Kill a Mockingbird was that it coincided with a history teacher that I had who I can't remember probably much at all about the history that he taught me because it was, you know, I was maybe 14. But he said the most important thing you can do as someone who's uh, eager to learn is to have empathy, whether it's for a person you're reading about, whether it's for a series of events, whether it's for some sort of historical phenomenon, try to have empathy, not sympathy. It can be a dreadful thing you're reading about, but it's the empathy of trying to put yourself in someone else's position to understand how something happened, why it happened. And that coincided with To Kill a Mockingbird for me. And uh, it was, you know, to be able to try to put yourself in the shoes of whether it was um, uh, the Robinson man, the black man, or uh, Atticus Finch, um, or Boo Radley, right? Boo Radley, the outsider, the ultimate outsider, or the, the ultimate mockingbird that shouldn't be killed because he was so harmless in the end. Um, but you know, those, those kind of lessons just stick with you and they come to life through a book like that. And that was one of the, the main themes of the book was, was Scout learning to be empathetic and learning That's to understand true. what it was like to... Because in the last and at the end of the book, she looks at, at the last couple of years through the eyes of Boo Radley when it finally occurs to her after everyone else reading the book has realised that he's actually a good character. She finally grows up and realises that he was watching. How it would have seemed to him watching the children on the other side of the street... So she finally learned. That's so right. Yeah. That's a that's a yeah. good note to end on. I think it's a wonderful book to read again. It's it's um it endures as 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 do all the books that you've mentioned today. So and you know the wonderful thing, um, Bella, is I suggested to my son recently to kill a mockingbird because it was one of those books that he wasn't required to read at school and he hasn't picked it up himself, and he was just overwhelmed by it. And you know to see the joy in someone else from a book that you've recommended. Is, is, is just lovely. It's a great gift to, um, to give someone, I think, whether, you know, you're physically giving someone a book or just recommending them to read a book that you loved, then to see that joy passed on is, um, is just wonderful. It really is. So on that note, on that very uplifting positive note, I'll thank you so much for your time today. I know how busy everyone is and how precious your time is, but being an absolute joy and I feel um, inspired and I've learned a lot about your, your life through the, through the books and I hope Thanks, you've enjoyed Bella. I hope you've enjoyed the discussion I've loved it it's been great thank you so just much just terrific what you're what you're doing is great because you are encouraging us to remember why we loved books and um and, and sharing that with other people is a lovely thing thank you so much and enjoy enjoy the freedom of New South Wales sorry <laughs> that's all right we're thinking of you <laughs> thank you so much bye bye